It lies here among 25,000 other Acts of Parliament in a small room at Westminster. A piece of paper that sought to end once and for all England's problem in Ireland by making Ireland part of the Union. Here it is, this act of union of Great Britain and Ireland that binds together two nations. You feel a real sense of excitement looking at this, touching it, because you think of the great political campaigns that were inspired by the act of union, but also of the thousands who lost their lives in the struggle over what it represented. In the first article, it describes how from the first day of January 1801 and forever after, Britain and Ireland shall be known as one kingdom, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. To this very day, men are willing to kill to try and break the Union. The Union passed into law at a time of international crisis. Britain faced war with France. And Ireland was dangerously unstable. A Protestant parliament ruled over a Catholic people. But bring both factions into a larger kingdom and Ireland's claustrophobic hatreds would evaporate. That was the theory. And so Protestant landlords were cajoled and bribed with money and peerages. And the Catholics promised reform of the remaining penal laws that excluded them from Parliament and public office. Nowhere was news of the Act of Union greeted with more anticipation than in the leadership of the Irish Catholic Church. There was an understanding with the British government that with Union would come the granting of Catholic emancipation, full political rights for Catholics. At a stroke, one of the most divisive issues in Ireland would be removed. Everything now depended on what happened next at Westminster. The Prime Minister, William Pitt, had looked to the example of Scotland, safely ensconced in the Union since 1746. But Pitt faced the opposition of anti-Catholic forces in his cabinet who encouraged King George III to oppose any change. The King believed that to grant full civil rights to Catholics would violate his coronation oath to uphold the Protestant faith. In the middle of an assembly of MPs, he stopped and shouted, I will consider every man my enemy who proposes that question to me. Pitt was humiliated and backed down. Pitt resigned within the year. His failure changed the course of Irish history. Had emancipation been granted, as was planned, in the 1790s or in the early 1800s as part of the Act of Union deal, I do not think that Catholicism in Ireland would have taken on the shape it did and would have become so associated with politics and later on with nationalism. It was that crucial delay that drove Catholics into an alliance with forces which were not always cooperative with the British state. Catholic alienation would be deepened by economic decline. When the war with France ended in 1815, agricultural prices collapsed and a booming population increased pressure on the land. This was a perilous situation in a country already overwhelmingly dependent on farming. The land was subdivided into ever smaller portions. A foreign observer described how the system worked. A wealthy man would let out some land to four others. They, in turn, would rent it to maybe 20, and they to another 100 people. They would then let it out to a 1,000 poor labourers. Little wonder that the hunger for land would become one of the defining themes of the Irish story. The Catholic peasantry were a people without land, political rights, or a champion. Their liberator would be one of the most remarkable figures of the 19th century, 
Daniel O'Connell. The typical 20th century figure that O'Connell would have the closest parallel to would be the late Martin Luther King in America. Uh, King was able to mobilize and, and politicize people who previously had been rather passive and, and indifferent. O'Connell was born into the small Catholic elite that had kept its lands after the penal laws. He was brought up here in County Kerry, but educated in France. There he witnessed the terror of the French Revolution, an experience that filled him with a lifelong dread of revolutionary violence. How would you describe O'Connell? O'Connell was, was a 19th century liberal. That is, he believed in constitutionalism, in uh, human rights. He supported that sort of thing in other countries and wanted it in Ireland. In 1823, O'Connell brought the Catholic Church directly into Irish politics. His Catholic association used church networks to mobilize the people to campaign for emancipation. They started collections outside of the church where the peasants could give a farthing a week, a penny a month, a shilling a year, and they could have a badge saying they were a member of the Catholic Association. And his marshals in this, his priests and captains, were the clergy. The Protestant bishop observed, there is what we have never before witnessed, a complete union of the Roman Catholics. O'Connell decided to provoke a crisis. He would challenge the law banning Catholics from Parliament unless they renounced their faith. In 1828, in County Clare, Daniel O'Connell became the first Catholic in Britain or Ireland to stand for Parliament in more than a hundred years. O'Connell won easily, but he also had support in government. The crisis presented pragmatists in the British cabinet with the opportunity to repeal the remaining laws against Roman Catholics. Catholic emancipation enables and empowers a whole world of Irish Catholics who previously, over the traumatic f first 20 years of the Union, have not seen any element of power open to them. It, it enables them to feel, I think, they have a stake. But there is a part of Ireland where the rise of O'Connell is greeted with fear. In Ulster, there were more than a million Protestants, descendants of the settlers who'd come in the 17th century. They ranged from landed gentry to farm laborers to factory workers. Many had prospered, creating thriving industry. Although some Protestant dissenters had led the rebellion of 1798, sectarian conflict with Catholics had helped to create a siege mentality among the growing Protestant working class. It's hard to think when you look at a shell like this that it once symbolized immense prosperity to Ulster Protestants, the world that they knew, the world that they felt secure in, was dependent on the link with Britain. It was that which guaranteed their jobs, their education, their special place in society, and of course, their religious identity. When they looked around the rest of the island and they saw the rise of somebody like Daniel O'Connell, the growth in the power of the Catholic Church, they felt panicked. O'Connell's supporters attempted a political invasion of Ulster. It failed, but sectarian fear escalated. Once you get clashes between large groups of people, then you get these general fears that actually, quite simply, they want to wipe us out. They've come here with a large group of people. We're defending this piece of space with our, with, with, with our group of people. It becomes a very elemental, very simple conflict. O'Connell failed to understand the power of Protestant fear. It was a failure Irish nationalists and British governments would continually repeat. And if Protestants were alarmed by the Emancipation Campaign, what O'Connell planned to do next would strike directly at the heart of the British Constitution. He was about to move from the politics of religion to those of union. 
Daniel O'Connell now set out on his most daunting campaign of all, to repeal the Act of Union, which joined Britain and Ireland together as one nation, and under which this country was ruled from London. Now, O'Connell wasn't a revolutionary. He didn't want Ireland to leave the wider British Empire. What his repeal campaign demanded was an Irish Parliament where Catholics would hold power. The majority of Catholic bishops and priests supported the campaign, and clerics went back into action to rally the people. O'Connell held some of the largest political meetings in European history. The greatest gathering was at Tara, seat of the old High Kings, where O'Connell's carriage took two hours to pass through the crowd. O'Connell stood here at Tara, reaching back into a mythic past to inspire his people. Reports from his supporters describe a crowd of a million people. Whatever about the exact numbers, it was certainly the largest gathering the country had ever seen. And it rattled the government. Within three months, O'Connell had been arrested and he would be jailed. The movement disintegrated. Mass demonstrations on their own could not win repeal. O'Connell needed political support at Westminster, and he had none. Within three years, he would be dead, taken mortally ill on a pilgrimage to Rome. But the tumult of O'Connell's era had created a generation of more radical nationalists. Inspired by the Gaelic past, these young Irelanders sought an identity that was politically and culturally separate to Britain. Their leader, Thomas Davis, a Protestant writer and thinker, echoed an earlier generation of Irish Protestants who'd led rebellion against Britain. Righteous men, he wrote, must make our land a nation once again. That determination will be immeasurably deepened by the events that unfold in the fields of Ireland. Here, the rural poor subsisted on overcrowded land and depended almost entirely on potatoes for their food. In 1845, disease attacked the crop. Phyphtophthora infestans would quickly become known as the blight. How did the blight work? What did it do to potatoes? Well, basically, it, it rotted the potatoes. It, 